It was another great turnout for the annual Polar Plunge. We'll show you who made the biggest splash in this half hour. We'll also find out why you might want to take advantage of a free and hands-on learning opportunity in White Bear Lake. moved on from Valentine's Day, but it's all about feeling the love in this episode. That's right. From plunging for special athletes to biking for a cure, the fire and police departments are teaming up to make a difference in our community. I'm Ron Hawkins. And I'm Tracy Minarchuk. Ramsey County Beach looked very different during the White Bear Lake Polar Plunge. Thousands of enthusiastic plungers, fans, and photographers created an atmosphere filled with energy and colorful characters. Take a look. Hello, plungers! Welcome to the White Bear Lake Polar Plunge, the first polar plunge of the season. more than $220,000 at this one event. And of course, we were among them. Yes, plunging. <laughs> yes, speaking of plunging, yes. you were um, on the cover 
of the White Bear Press. I, yes, yeah. yeah, I was very surprised. Opened it, or I had some people tell me, and I'm like, ah, uh, Was it you your serious? leggings? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> must have been, I don't know. That was, yeah. uh, yes, photographer Paul Dolls from uh, White Bear Press. Did a That's good job at nice. capturing the moment, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> and it was a little cold, I thought. This year, I thought it was cold. Yeah, it was it's a, little, uh, a little extra cold, yeah. and you know. But I tell you, that's an incredible amount of money raising for the special. Yes, it is. Olympics. I'm very and proud of White Bear Lake and our plunge and how much money we raise every year. So, yes, and so nice much job. enthusiasm. It's just incredible the amount of enthusiasm. Yep. Go Bears! <laughs> We're going to take a break, but first we have some important safety reminders for parents. Hi, I'm Sergeant John Betty. Did you know car crashes are the leading killer of kids under the age of 14? Knowing how to protect your child with the proper restraint may mean the difference between life and death in a crash. Three out of four car seats are used incorrectly in Minnesota, and most parents don't know what restraints their kids should progress through as they grow. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, children should remain in a rear-facing car seat until they're two years old. There are many resources, both online and in person in Minnesota, to help you correctly install car seats. Children should begin using booster seats after turning four and weigh 40 to 60 pounds. It's safe as they remain in a booster until they're four feet, nine inches tall, or at least eight years old. Again, there are many resources to help you understand and what to do and how to do it. Fines for breaking child restraint laws can cost more than $100, not to mention be extremely dangerous. Kids are vulnerable. They rely on adults to do what's right. So do the right thing and protect your kids against a potentially deadly car ride. I'm John Vetti. I'll see you next time. Anyone in the world, we've interviewed a lot of people on this show, but there are a lot who haven't been. If you could pick one person in. Boy, you know, I guess, you know, something that we could realistically do really, I think would be, it'd be really fun to interview more uh, retirees from the fire department, you know, people that have been on the depart on the fire department many, many, many years ago and just kind of give us some insights about what it was like uh, to be a firefighter way back then. I think that would be interesting. <laughs> Welcome back. The MS-150 team is recruiting members. Every year the team rides to raise money for multiple sclerosis and to honor those living with MS. Retired White Bear Lake firefighter Dave Jar is among them. Welcome Hello. to the show, Dave. Hello. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Yeah. Not a problem. So let's just start off by just uh, uh, telling us a little bit about you, where you grew up, maybe a little bit about your family. And you were on the fire department? Yep. Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in White Bear. I lived here until 2006 when I moved to Roseville with my wife. I uh, was on the department from 81 to 92. And, uh, well, that's about it. I mean, my kids both grew up here. And now they're Go old. Bears, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I was a fish. Come on. <laughs> I was a dolphin. So. Okay. Mariners, so, get it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even grow up in White Bear. I didn't either. <laughs> but I know that. <laughs> anyway, so multiple school ulcer. When were you diagnosed? Kind of tell us, I guess, uh, a little bit about uh, the symptoms that you developed and kind of how the diagnosis process came about. Well, I was di officially diagnosed in 91. Uh, with an MRI a scan of the brain. But uh, knowing what the disease is, looking back at it, I had symptoms way before then. So Just okay. nothing that was concerning to go to the doctor yeah. or get checked out, that sort of thing? Well, the first time I really went to the doctor about it is I had sort of like stroke-like symptoms. Um. My whole right side of my body was numb. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the doctor and they thought it was a pinched nerve at the time. Oh. Okay. And then I, uh, 
kept going on with other problems and then they decided to put me in the, I call it the tube, had an <laughs> MRI done and they said, well, there's something more going on here. Okay. So, okay, so at, at that point, did they know that it was MS or it was, at that point they needed to do further tests? No, at that point when they saw what they call placking on my brain, they knew it was MS. Okay, so the doctor says, Dave, you've got multiple sclerosis. What are you thinking at that point? Or, I mean, did you know much about the disease at that point? No, I did not. I was thinking MD, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So <laughs> I go, I'm too active to lose everything. And so you're you're thinking about, you know, the people in wheelchairs and I mean, yep. just, you kind of get a, a vision of, of what these various diseases are by what we see on TV. Right. Yep. Stuff. Yeah. And Jerry Lewis and everything. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. And but that's a muscular, muscular dystrophy. Yep. So, uh, so you're learning more about the disease and. Yeah. Well, the best thing in the world happened to me on that Sunday. Mm -hmm. I went to church, and a lady at church goes, "Don't worry about it." She goes, "I've had MS for 15 years." Mm -hmm. If you let it get you down, it's going to take you down. Mm. He goes, you just got to stay positive and keep moving. And that, I live by that rule ever since. Mm -hmm. Keep moving, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the symptoms, just to kind of give us a better understanding of, uh, you know, of people that may not know anything about it and they have a loved one that says, you know, I've got... I've got MS, some yeah. things that they should be aware of. Well, what happened with me is it started off with my hand would be numb. I'd shake it like it's asleep. It'd come back, and then all of a sudden my whole right arm would be numb. Mm. And then the whole right side would numb. And that's when I went to the doctors and did all the routines and got on medicine for it. You mm -hmm. know. And so you still have ongoing symptoms like that that come and go? Or are they pretty well, consistent? Put it this or? way, I haven't felt my legs from my knees on down for 20 years. Oh my gosh. But you're still getting around. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're a young guy, you get around. Yeah. You use a cane though. I use a cane, I have an AFO because a foot drop is a oh, okay. common problem with MS. You lose control of your feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Now, um, so let's talk about the times of the year. Is anything different in the winter versus the summer, your symptoms? For me, I like the cold. Okay. When it's hot out, the symptoms get worse. Mm. Okay. So I, I, like today, it's cold, people are dressed up for cold. <laughs> and I'm going, this is nice out here. <laughs> you know? yeah. I I, the cold does not affect me. And I've heard that from other people that have MS, that uh, that the heat is just uh, you know, one of those things that is just very hard to, to tolerate. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So now, so we're doing the MS 150 in June, and uh, the last couple of years we've uh, been dedicating the ride to a couple of people related yep. to the fire department, in addition to some other friends and family members of the team, you and, and Paul Munns, and uh, any. Any thoughts uh, that came to your mind, I guess, when we when I called you and said, hey, you know, are you okay with us dedicating the ride to you? I never have a problem with that. Okay. You know, people got to learn what MS is about. The hardest thing is, look at me, I look okay. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's underlying. I mean, being as outgoing as I was and then having this disease, it's a pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I used to do a lot of outdoor activities. Now they are curtailed. Mm -hmm. I still, the only thing I get to still do is deer hunt. Mm -hmm. But for me to go deer hunting, it, I go out there, I get close to my stand, then it takes me 45 minutes to an hour to walk 100 yards to get mm -hmm. into my stand. Mm -hmm. But I still do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it well, must be difficult from being a firefighter and responding quickly to things and carrying things and yep. trumping upstairs and all of that stuff mm -hmm. to, yeah. like you just mentioned, just having difficulties and yep. taking so much longer to do those yeah. simple things. So we got uh, uh, anything else to add before we close up? <laughs> no, I just want people to know that MS, they're doing great strides with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on 
a medicine that I've been taking every day in my life for 20 years. Okay. An injection. And they're making good strides in curing it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, we still need help. Good, good. I we'll hope that. Hopefully, uh, we get you some money. Yeah. From the MS150 that you're doing. Yep. And people to come out and support the yeah, team and that's, support. That's what our fundraising is all yeah. about: to uh, mm -hmm. uh, raise money for research and uh, new yep. developments and treatment, yep. and hopefully at some point to cure. Of course. Yeah, well. <laughs> that Move would be that direction. Tough. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. We appreciate you coming out. <laughs> yeah. No problem. If you're interested in learning more about the ride or joining us, check out our team page. It's truly a rewarding experience. Well, Ron isn't the only one looking for some good men and women. The White Bear Lake Annual Citizen Fire Academy is about to get underway, and we recently talked with a former participant who has a close connection to the department. Nope. Nope. I but sure I was interested. She was just some blind <laughs> gal sitting in the class. Registered nurse Karen Peterson knows the world of medicine within four walls, but on four tires was something new. This is ambulance two. We got four of these. EMS was one of the many topics covered when she took the Citizens Fire Academy. And we've got EMTs, and there's th uh, four EMTs to a team, and a 10-week program headed by Assistant Fire Chief Joel Hewitt. They meet once a week for two and a half hours and it's free. I didn't think of Tuesday evenings as, oh gosh, I gotta go to class. It was more like, yes, I get to go to class. What so, are we doing tonight? Yeah. Joiners get hands-on experience, including rappelling from the tower wall. I love that part. That was one of my favorites. Wearing 40 to 50 pounds of gear and practicing life-saving skills. She did, uh, Everything we asked, you know, search and rescue, we did what? What did we do? We did the car stuff? Excavation. And Extrication. Extrication. <laughs> yeah, yes, Siri. <laughs> it wasn't until the end people caught on Joel and Karen had something special going on. Of course, the instructors and the other presenters knew, but a lot of the other people that were attending didn't know. So they started catching on. Oh. Joe's your husband. <laughs> yeah. Karen says she worries about fire calls. It's what prompted her to participate in the CFA. Well, you always worry when they leave the, the house, you know, um, what, what are they going to? Um, you just, you never know. Joel says he's grateful she showed interest in his world. Well, it was interesting for me to, that she actually took the time and, and you know, really took 10 weeks of her, her life to really figure out what what I did when I left the house. <laughs> the couple says other family members of the department have come through the course and families have taken it together. There's even a Citizens Fire Academy alumni group that meets and volunteers for department events. It's just a wide variety of experience that you get and knowledge that you, that you gain and especially if you have a family member or a spouse that is involved. It's nice so that you can see what they go through and what, what happens when they leave the house to, to go to one of these calls. <laughs> you can contact Assistant Fire Chief Joel Hewitt for more information. If you don't make it this year, there's always next year. Well, coming up after the break, we visit a 911 dispatcher turned author to talk about her latest book. This message brought to you by FEMA. Home fires occur most often in winter. Keep anything that can catch fire at least three feet from heating equipment. And never use an oven to heat your home. Stay in the kitchen when frying, grilling, or broiling food. Turn space heaters off when you leave the room or go to bed. Make sure all vents are clear of snow and ice to allow carbon monoxide to vent outside. Have your furnace, heating system, and chimneys serviced each year by a qualified professional. Learn more at www.usfa.fema.gov. That would have to be somebody from the police department or from the fire department or again anybody in the whole anybody wide the world. Jeez. Uh, Maybe some music person. Like, I don't know. Metallica or Lady Gaga. That'd be interesting. <laughs> Oh, 
welcome back. There have been some D.A.R.E. graduations going on. Yep. And D.A.R.E. is such a long-running program that I think sometimes we forget about it, but it's still very much alive in White Bear Lake. Yes, and it's changed over the years. I've been teaching it for a long time, since the 1900s. <laughs> and it's uh, been updated and, you know, they talk about decision making and stuff. And just this year alone, we added a new school for Saudi Catholic Academy. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so and, and uh, another DARE officer and I have been looking at some of the other curriculum for middle school. So we're looking at that. Very important program, right. though, and I know people that have been through the have been through that class years later. They still remember it, and so way to go, Tracy. Well, thank and, you. And I think talking to the kids and just having that relationship and that rapport with them is a is a good thing too. So it's not good. just the curriculum, but mm -hmm. being there with them, making that relationship. Yep. In the past year, there's been a lot more competition between the police and fire departments. <laughs> the latest sport of choice is hockey. While we're looking at some photos, can you tell me about this game? Yes. The hockey game? As a matter of fact, <laughs> you know, I don't have first hand knowledge because oh. I wasn't there. Oh. All I right. would have loved to been, but uh, I couldn't make it. But. Uh, so emergency dispatcher Brian kind of came up with this idea as I understand it and he put the word out by email just seeing if there was any uh, uh, interest guys that, you know guys or gals that are uh, interested in playing hockey and uh, so I think it's a good mix of some people that are pretty good and a good mix of some people that are not pretty good. <laughs> uh, and they had a great time, you know, they're, mm -hmm. and uh, so every year, every winter, I think he plans on trying to get together at least a couple of games and some good camaraderie. And, it looks like they have fun. Yeah. yeah. So years ago, we interviewed White Bear Lake native and former White Bear Lake dispatcher, Carolyn Bureau, about her book, Answering 911. Last fall, she published another book, and producer Mary Klein and photographer Nick Anderson visited her at home to talk about her life in dispatch and her road to becoming a published author. My second grade teacher told my mom that I was such a good writer, and uh, um, my mom still has the book and she bound it. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom's a big fan. <laughs> Many published authors will likely agree theirs is a path of rejection and persistence, but in Caroline Bureau's case, it was inevitable. Oh, hey, no. Hey, no. Mm -hmm. Even if it took a few detours to get there. I got very like faint at the sight of blood, and um, so that doesn't make for a very good nurse. When nursing school didn't pan out, she switched to journalism and got a job in print first job was as a reporter at a weekly newspaper. There were a few different weeklies. Um, I switched jobs a couple times. She became interested in 911 dispatching while working the police beat at the White Bear Press. Disillusioned with the realities of reporting, she changed course yet again. I, I was really freaked out. <laughs> I really, I spent the first year thinking, what did I do? I had never had to process that much that quickly. So I was stressed out, I, <laughs> I was overeating, I was, um, you know, I was going home cranky all the time. She found a natural way to decompress was through writing, keeping notes of life in dispatch, eventually submitting 50 pages to the loft in Minneapolis. She was accepted into a mentorship program there, and two years into her dispatching career, answering 911 was published. I didn't win the lottery or anything, you know. Um, you're not going to quit your day job, um, usually. Though she you're... didn't get rich, she did gain opportunities, including an appearance on the Dr. Phil show. Although a less than positive one, it made an interesting chapter in her second book. Tell me exactly what happened. I better let him out. Caroline does technical writing during the day, but hasn't forgotten those stressful nights. She remains empathetic to dispatchers and first responders, and points out despite the many 911 calls she received, no emergency ever seemed the same. It's real easy to look back at something and go, well, you should have done that. Hell yeah. <laughs> Make sure to check out Caroline's website to learn more about her or to order one of her books. 
We're out of time for this edition of Lake Area Beat. I'm Tracy Minartek. And I'm Ron Hawkins. We'll see you next time.